Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Titus Winters. Uh, much as I hate to do my own introductions, I will say a couple things briefly so that we're on the same page. I've been leading most of the C++ common library efforts at Google for eight years now. I'm a maintainer for Google C++ Style Guide. I founded Absail. I'm now the chair for Library Evolution on the C++ standards body. Uh, I'm the chair for the new SG15 on tooling, uh, as well as a general committee member for a few years. I've done tons of training and guidance. I write a lot of the tip of the week series that's publishing on absail.io. Uh, I work professionally at providing good guidance on API design, and I am also subjected to the pain of fixing it when we get it wrong. It is not just a vacuum, which is to say, hopefully you can trust that I'm not just making stuff up. A prelude. Uh, you know how in like a good book, a novel or something like that, you uh, get started with something that makes absolutely no sense until three quarters of the way through? Prelude number one. Once upon a time, Euclid came up with the rules for geometry. This would be things like you can draw a line segment between two points, you can extend a line segment into an infinite line, you can draw a circle from a point in a radius, uh, all right angles are equal. But it takes five rules, five postulates, to underpin everything that we understand about geometry in two dimensions. Four of them seem like, yeah, okay, that's pretty fundamental for geometry. And the fifth is sort of weird. Two lines that are parallel to the same line are parallel to each other. Geometers tried for almost 2,000 years to prove that the last one was actually a side effect of the others. Uh, in any variation. There's many ways that you can form this last one, but some fifth rule, some parallel postulate is always necessary to actually get a full implementation of planar geometry, 2D geometry. In the end, what we actually discovered after years and years and years and years, millennia, centuries of trying to prove the fifth from the first four, is that there are actually just variations on that fifth rule, on that parallel postulate, that in some geometries, parallel lines are parallel, and in others, they diverge or they converge, and that these all form actually self-consistent, intelligent <coughs> systems for evaluating geometry. These are non-Euclidean geometry. There's no way that this is foreshadowing. <laughs> Why do we talk about design? We talk about design, I think, because we want to ensure that things are usable. By looking at what works and what doesn't work, we find ideas and design patterns that are easy to follow and that make the resulting APIs easy to work with. In the end, design is here to serve us. This is largely not about math or fundamental principles of the universe, but there are places where the math and the symbolic logic can inform good design, and that may be helpful to us. But when it is down to who is it serving, and there are rules, and there is symbolic logic, we have a choice in some cases whether we are prescriptivist or descriptivist. Uh, this is just like the terms in grammar, right? You can be a prescriptive grammarian or a descriptive grammarian. Do you take the rules that were written down in some grammar textbook and you say that these are the rules? Or do you look at how grammar and language has evolved and say, oh, we can have different rules about grammar because reasons. See what I did there? <laughs> or alternatively, on the uh, opposite side, do we see the mess that we've made and try to produce rules that just guide us to good results, regardless of what previous rules may have said? Keep these things in mind. This talk will be in roughly three parts, starting small with basic units of design and working our way up to big questions like, is this an acceptable design pattern for types? So we're going to wade in, starting on the small end of this, and hopefully move up to bigger, more interesting parts of the design spectrum. But first, a question. What is the atom of C++ API design? That is, what is the fundamental small chunk of design? This might not be the smallest chunk. There are protons that are smaller than atoms, after all. But it should be the small thing that we reach about, that we think about things in terms of. And if you asked me this a year ago, I would have said the function, and I would have assumed that this was a trick question. 
uh, after all, this is the function, that's the thing that we use the most, right? Free functions, member functions, special member functions. But recently I've started to think that maybe functions are protons. The better unit of design is slightly larger. The better unit of design is the overload set. When overload sets are well designed, and it turns out there is very good agreement on what makes up a well designed overload set, overload sets are a better unit of design, especially as we move into a richer type system, concepts, and deeper understanding of move semantics and move semantic designs. Somewhat formally, an overload set is a collection of functions in the same scope of the same name, so that if any of them is found by name lookup, they will all be found. Um, but this only captures the syntax, not the semantics of a good overload set. Uh, the core guidelines has some things to say about overload sets. It says overload operations that are roughly equivalent, that is, if you have two things that are doing the same thing, roughly the same thing, name them the same thing. And also, overload only for options that are roughly equivalent, that is, if they are named the same thing, they'd better be doing the same thing. So names are the atoms? Names are the atoms, Tony is correct. Uh, the Google C++ style guide says this, uh, use overloaded functions, including constructors, only if a reader looking at a call site can get a good idea of what is going on without having to figure out which member of the set is chosen. And in both of these cases, I think what we're sort of saying is, the semantics of the functions that make up the set should be the same without trying to come up with a fuzzy way of saying the semantics of a function that takes different types are the same. Like, that, that's tricky. Um, there are some properties of a good overload set. I will come back to this a little bit once we have some examples. Uh, so let's look first at ways that we can vary our overloads. Um, we can overload on arity, uh, sircat in absail. Uh, historically, we had sircat even before we had C++11, and there was a point where sircat was an overload set of 25, 26 different overloads of how many alpha num things are we willing to take. Uh, at some point, we got C++11 and switched to variadic templates. It's still not just a variadic template because for uh, optimization purposes, the first handful of arities, like one through five, are just left as functions. And it doesn't matter. None of that matters, right? We talk about it in terms of it is one unit. It is one unit of design. It is stir-cat. It does not matter which one of these you are calling. It does not matter how many parameters you're passing. It does not matter the types that you're passing to stir-cat. It's just one thing. We can overload on varied, but usually related types. Uh, we see very commonly in, in legacy code, in the standard library as well, uh, overloads on stringish things, right? We could take a char star and a const string ref. And this is a great example of a well-designed overload set. You've got some sort of stringish data. The reader doesn't need to know which type you're calling it with exactly. And we can see at a glance that the semantics are the same for both of them, because in this case, one is implemented in terms of the other. We also see overloads throughout the standard library for optimization as a result of the addition of move semantics. So we'll see things like pushback. This fits with and slightly expands our definition of same semantics and don't need to know which of these is called. At the call site, the user doesn't have to care whether it's the L value or R value version of pushback. At most, they need to look out for use after move, but that's not a property of pushback. That's a property of use after move everywhere, right? You see a call to std move, don't use it, right? Uh, it also helps to flush out what we mean by same semantics. It's the same post condition on the vector, but not necessarily the same post condition for the T that is being passed. However, we don't care about the T that is being passed. It's either const or a temporary or moved from, and in none of those cases are we gonna really worry about it. Right? So we're talking about same semantics, same post conditions, same return values, those types of things. And it's also very worth noting that the calling code, so long as it is obeying the like well defined restrictions, would be the same behavior, not the same optimization, if we removed the R value pushback. Right? This is not gonna break the correctness of basically anything. Uh, with those examples as guidance for the types of things that can be the same, let's look at the overload set guidance again. Correctness can be judged at the call site without knowing which overload is picked. And I particularly like a single good comment can describe the full set. <laughs> 
For stircat, that would be something like takes all the provided al arguments, calculates their string length, uh, allocates a string of that size, and copies them into that string buffer and gives you the stringified result. For the foo example, it would be something like do x on the given string. And for vector pushback, it would be something like adds this t to the back of the vector. This leaning into this definition of good overload set pushes the squishiness of good overload set a little bit back on what is a good comment and still smacks a little bit of I can't define it, but I'll know it when I see it. But a common thing to look at is practically speaking, if your comment has to simulate overload resolution, you're doing it wrong. Right? If you can describe it in terms of absolutes, it's probably a good set. If you have to specifically call out which is which, it's probably not a good set. How yeah? is the white function going to return an int? <laughs> Thank you. The question was, why are my slides bad? Uh, when we start consciously treating overload sets as the base unit of design, we start seeing them in plain sight in other places. And the most important overload set of all is APIs that we've discussed a ton in the last few years, but usually not in terms of being an overload set. Talking, of course, of copy versus move. And I really like the formulation of copy and move as an overload set. Bryce. I do not have an example of a bad overload set in the standard library. Uh, there is an example of a terrible overload set in core guidelines. Um, and I will give you some examples of uh, techniques that people like that lead to bad overload sets. But yeah. Uh, any other questions? All right. Uh, formulating copy and move as an overload set sort of has great ramifications and really pays off nicely the more that you buy into it. Uh, the type trait for is move constructible isn't stupid anymore. Right? It has always bothered me that is move constructible didn't tell you anything about whether the type in question had a move constructor, just whether syntactically you could construct it from a temporary. That always like, felt like a mismatch. Right? Now in this model, just like it's up to the author of an overload set uh, to add overloads when appropriate. It's up to the type author to add it to ensure that move is efficient if possible. It's up to the user to ensure that move is used if it would be relevant. And the two of them don't actually have to be coordinating much. The user doesn't have to know if a type has a move constructor. You don't need to know which member of an overload set is chosen. And the semantics of copy and versus move must be the same for the destination. This matches what our concepts that are being defined in the standard library says. This matches the committee behavior over the last few years. I have a paper P0921, which you'll all hear a lot more about, as it's the rights that the committee is reserving for future changes to the library. One of the things it says in there is, move is an optimization of copy, which is a simple way of saying, move and copy shall be a well-designed overload set. And explicitly conceptualizing everything even constructors as an overload set pays dividends. It starts giving us guidance on some things like when do we mark things explicit? When you view your constructors as an overload set, we can start asking, does the user need to know which constructor was invoked? Make it explicit. Does the reader need to know that a non-copy constructor was invoked? Is it important? If so, make it explicit. Uh, viewed another way, Copy and move are the canonical constructors that take one parameter. We know their semantics. They take a T and they make a new T that's like that T. That's the canonical constructor semantics. So if your constructor doesn't take a T, but takes some type or other types, if you would usually be comfortable passing T and U as an overload set, then you're probably fine. That's most commonly the case where T and U represent the same platonic idea. Tony has talked about stuff like this. On the other hand, if it's merely the case that we can construct a T from some bag of parameters, like uh, reservation and initial value for vector, uh, but those aren't basically actually a T, then those should be explicit. All of that said, all right, let that sink in a little bit. 
All that said, there is a really common pattern of, that I see in people attempting to use overload sets that just doesn't work. And the highlight there is don't equals delete a member of the set. So, for instance, don't equals delete in an overload set to describe lifetime requirements. You see things like this. You say, no temporaries. I do not allow you to use temporaries. And the problem is that no temporaries and things that have the lifetime that I actually require for this API are not synonyms, right? That is a fairly disconnected, overlapping, but largely disconnected set. Generally, the lifetime requirement for a parameter that isn't just as long as this function is going to be hard to pin down. The options for lifetime requirements are fairly complex. It could be must live until the next call, or very commonly it's constructors or setters that are borrowing a reference, storing a pointer or a reference, uh, or started kicking off asynchronous work. Right? And in any of these cases, the thing that you're going to have to do is actually probably document it. Right? And the solution, like what a user is going to do when you do this to them, the most common way that they're going to work around the no temporaries is just make an automatic variable right there. OK, now it compiles again. I still haven't read the comment. But what are the odds that your, the new lifetime of that automatic variable actually matches the requirement of your API? Pretty slim. In general, uh, it's going to require detailed API documentation to explain your lifetime requirements. And the freeform nature of that comment is a lot more complex than the type system in C++. All of which is to say, the solution to documenting lifetime requirements on borrowed references is either A, don't make it a borrowed reference, or B, document the requirement. The type system cannot do this for you. I suppose that if you really want to equals delete this thing on top of all that, I guess it's fine, but I wouldn't really do it. Like, it's messy, misleading, confusing, a half measure, false sense of security. I wouldn't accept it in code review. On the flip side, I see people try to equals delete a thing to say, ah, I know that you should not use this function with a copy. You must always give me a move. In simple cases, maybe even most cases, this looks fine. So here we're imagining I have a DNA scan. It takes some configuration and some string. And it's so expensive that it's going to return me a future of whether this scan matches. Okay, And this works fine on our values. In general, though, you don't know all of the ways that your API is ever going to be used. That is fundamental to the whole business of providing an API. Right? We're building a platform. You can't predict all of the ways that your types and functions and everything are going to be hooked together. While it may be the case that you know that many invocations of your API should be done via move and not copy, you can't know it for everything. Right? Imagine that I have a modify that takes a DNA and is expensive. Right? Doing the quick, cheap, still compiles with the deleted member uh, here is actually going to be inefficient because I'm running the modify twice. And in order to do this without the modify, it gets a lot more verbose. Right? My point being, you can't really know that nobody is going to need the copy API. If you provide it, the calling code is certainly simpler when it needs it. And if you do happen to know that copies must never happen, you probably want to make that a property of the type, not the function. Make a DNA class, if you're so worried about accidentally copying things, that you're willing to be overzealous about it, and then make that copyable, not implicitly, but with some like, easily greppable API. And I've sort of snuck in here a pass by value sync design. Here, DNA scan is accepting the string, the DNA, probably a really big string, by value. Other things, like earlier vector pushback, do this as an overload set. Which one is right? Is vector pushback a well designed overload set? Should everybody be syncing things in that form? And this question has been asked and answered in many different ways. There's been a lot of discussion here. And I think it's important, actually, for us to ask some more detailed questions. Because uh, just like uh, Jonathan's uh, presentation about pointer-like types, right, it turns out there's some fundamental complexity to this question. Okay? So first, 
Is this a generic or am I syncing a specific type? That might affect how much you can know about it. For the type or types that are being sunk, how expensive is the function compared to a copy or a move for that type? Are you making an RPC call? Are you taking a lock? Or are you just storing the thing? Uh, are there multiple parameters that are being sunk? This can get combinatorially uh, explosive if you start having multiple parameters and you want to have the full explosion of those uh, supported. Also, do I know that this will always be a sync of exactly T? Or maybe you can just take anything that converts to T. Right? You might be better off not taking T by value in such a case. And Herb's question that uh, has come up a few times, could allocation reuse dominate? I'm going to sort of sneakily lump that into the cost of move and copy compared to the operation of the function itself. And there may still be other questions here that I haven't considered. Anyone have a good one? What is allocation reuse? For a move assignment operator, if you already have a string, for instance, if you always move in the string that is being sunk to you, uh, then if you at some point had a nice large allocation, uh, when you move it in, you're going to shrink down to whatever the provided allocation was. Uh, whether you wanted it to be less allocation or whether you wanted to, oh, someday I'll need this big allocation, it's going to depend a lot on your particular domain, I think. Uh, other questions that we might want to ask? Uh, I am accepting a T of some form and storing it. Uh, the question was, can I define sync? I'm accepting a T and storing it. Yeah. Is that, is that also account for like reference wrapper like types? Like if it's a, it's a reference domain object, it doesn't really own anything that's like a, a copy of that object. Does, does that count as a sync or is that? If you're accepting the reference wrapper by value. You, are the you always pass reference wrapper. Yeah, I mean, you always pass reference wrapper by value. <laughs> Um, I don't know. I'd have to think about it. Honestly, I never use reference wrapper. Well, like in the case of the network PSO, it's like a dynamic buffer type that requires um, move constructability, and but the underlying buffer is never going to be owned by the user. Like in an asynchronous way, kind of like a relay. Like yeah. Does this keep the pointer a reference that the user has? Yeah. The right in the in the networking TS, there's a type that is requires it to be move constructible, but does not own the buffer. Yeah. Uh, I think that is talking about a slightly different thing. It's at least an unusual API. But for, for sync, you're always taking it. You're, you're going to store a copy. Right. For sync, you're going to store a copy, or if not store a copy, you're going to mutate it <laughs> once. Like you. Here's the thing. You want to capitalize it before you operate on it. You might still sync it, even if you're not storing it. Uh, other. For syncing, you want things that have value semantics. Um, if you wanted to provide uh, a shop of execution risk and you needed to store a second all that structure. Ah, if you wanted to have strong type safety guarantees and you wanted to throw outside of the constructor. I don't see if that affects this necessarily, so long as we're back on the we're operating on values. But I haven't thought that through deeply. The point is you're, you're, you're doing a mutation on a copy. Yeah, but we're doing our mutation on a copy. When yeah. the string copy happens. Yeah. That's why you said outside the structure. Yeah. The argument gets moved into the parameter. Yes. The, there's an argument about a pass to each, each of your shells, right? Like, oh, if it move, if you're, OK. If the argument is moved into the parameter and then you throw. Don't throw from your move constructors. Sorry? Don't throw from your move constructors. Oh, yes, true. I don't see that it changes the question of how we accept these. But we'll think about it. Yes, the FU, OK. The idea being, you've moved something in there, an exception is now thrown, the object is lost. If you moved it, you shouldn't care. 
Chandler. Okay. Pass by value makes it harder to provide strong acceptance based guarantees. Chandler says uh, pass by value makes it harder to have strong exception safety guarantees as opposed to weak exception ga safety guarantees or operate in a world with no exceptions. Um, all right. So, modulo exceptions, which we will have to research a bit and I will be happy to talk about, I will throw the following out. Uh, have the pushback overload set. If the implementation, if the cost of your function is small compared to move constructing a T, right? This is why pushback is doing this, because the entire cost of pushback is moving the T. The downside to this is it is more complicated. You are going to get worse error messages, you are going to get worse compilation performance, and it can be combinatorial if you are accepting multiple parameters. Uh, if the implementation is likely larger cost than move constructing a T, then maybe you just accept by value. Depends a bit on your exception safety requirements, I think. Um, but you must also at the same time be sure that you will always be a sync for exactly T, not things that are convertible to T, things like that. And if the implementation is likely larger cost than even copy constructing a T, I'm gonna go make some system calls now. Uh, then just accept const T ref. No one is ever going to be confused by it and you have great flexibility for the future. Bryce. You notice this is why generic code tends to do the overload set thing. All right. If you happen to know exactly what your T's are going to be, it is much easier to make this analysis. Uh, repeat, repeat his, comment. his comment was, uh, it is hard to know exactly what the cost of move constructing or copy constructing a T is going to be in generic code. Thank you. Right. Yes. Any reason why you're not uh, talking about forwarding references here? Those are not really syncing the parameter. But they can be equivalent to the const plus par value and they reward event having the combinatorial explosion. Uh, Vittorio's question is, uh, d doing this in generic context with forwarding reference avoids the combinatorial explosion, which I suppose is probably true. Chandler. You're also not mentioning the optimization barrier presented by using references here at all. There are cases where by value is actually flat out more efficient. Chandler's point is optimization is much easier in the by value case. So the people that like writing generics will argue for forwarding, and the people that write compilers will argue for just pass it by value. Alistair. Forwarding references don't avoid the combinatorial problem, they just automate the solution. <laughs> Alistair's point is forwarding references do not uh, avoid the combinatorial problem, they just automate it for us. Anyway, some rough guidance. Let's talk about non-syncs. Uh, when talking about non-sync overloads, we often see things like this, I mentioned this earlier. In more modern code, we would see this as probably string view. Although this runs up against questions of the char star constructor and how to handle null, and I'll just leave that there and run away in terror. <laughs> But once we start talking about string view as a or the string-like parameter type, then we start looking at other common non-owning parameter types, and span comes to mind. These both have unusual designs as types. We'll definitely get into that later. And, but span opens up an even bigger can of worms for us. Unlike character data, span tries to be general any contiguous range of type T. But there are lots of contiguous ranges of not quite T that you might want to use. A brief aside, consider pointers and smart pointers. We can easily publish guidance on things like don't pass unique pointer by const ref. In general, if you want to pass a pointer, you should pass the pointer, not the wrapping ownership information. So those of us that do a lot of code reviews, get it quickly ingrained when you see const unique pointer ref suggest const T star or const T ref. However, types don't actually decompose. A vector of unique pointer t is not convertible to a vector of t star. And if you've got a vector of owned pointers and need to invoke a function of vector of t star, there just isn't a good way to do that. And so modeling on span, it's not hard to imagine producing a more generic span of t-ish things. 
I've seen this in my code base now as any span. I don't love that name. Uh, this effectively type erases a contiguous container of things that we know that can be converted to tref or t star in a clear fashion. And we can, of course, go further and further down this rabbit hole. Maybe it doesn't need to be contiguous. Maybe it's just a range. Stepping back a little, C++ is a language about types. When we are overloading for non-owning reference parameters, this is really about getting closer to duck typing in terms of what is accepted. Give me anything that looks and quacks like a duck, and I'll use it like a duck. And there's two main conventions that are emerging in this space, one for library and one for language. In library, we can build non-owning reference parameter types, string view, span, any span, ranges, or we can move in a language direction to more generic code and use concepts. And when it comes to this question, I don't think the community has nearly enough experience to provide good predictions or guidance yet. My suspicion is that this will come down to whether the library of types like string view and span is found to be sufficiently expressive. If the library providers of the world build a rich set of parameter types like these and agree on how to define them, then we'll probably go that way. Louis. Seems like there's a fundamental difference between these concepts and something like string view or whatever, right? Because or, or span. I mean, one of them is basically type erasure. I'll get there. Louis thinks that there's a difference between these things. I agree that there's a difference between these things in some sense, but we'll get there. Right. Why do we need any span? Span has a converting constructor and a span of other element type, which is convertible to the element type you've requested. So we can get a span to T issues. Yeah, uh, the question is why do you need an any span? Uh, because span converts to between types that are uh, convertible. Uh, you can't implicitly convert from unique pointer to T star. But there's absolutely no reason not to accept a vector, a, a span of T star when I have a vector of unique pointer. Right? Marshall. The, the problem with that is that what, uh, what spans converting constructor converts from is a pointer a pointer to something that's convertible to, to from a pointer to u to a pointer to t. It doesn't convert from u to t. And so you end up with, they, they have to be the same size. And so you, you, you end up with a pointer to t, and you get a bunch of u's, and that's not yeah. what you want. Marshall points out that spans conversions are less, uh, are less bonkers than that. <laughs> uh, so. I was saying, if the library of providers of the world build a rich set of types like these, then we'll probably just go that way. Uh, and this approach already has a head start. If we invest a similar amount of effort in concepts and training, and we find only a comparable set of sharp edges for concept usage versus span usage, it may be in some cases that concepts comes to be how we express these things. But that is a pretty significant shift with a lot of unknowns, and it's unclear yet whether everyday programmers can write in that generic duct-typed fashion effectively and safely. We'll see how that turns out. We already have a trial of this going on, even without concepts, in the form of std function. Uh, uh, so just to clarify, you could imagine a future where instead of overload states, it was just a single function taking a concept or just... Yeah. Just to clarify, I could imagine a future where instead of overload sets, we just use a concept to describe the overload set that we're allowing. But even without concepts, uh, we can fairly reasonably write something that takes a callable in language or library form. Both of these have their uses, but I think when we're writing everyday code, we're more likely to reach for the library form, and that seems telling on this question. Until we have erasure and storage for concept things, I think we're likely to reach for the library solution pretty regularly going forward. If I had to guess, uh, we're going to devote some significant energy to both and wind up with a set of powerful concepts in this space that are then type erased and made into library types. And most user code will wind up dealing with those types instead of concepts directly. But that's just a guess, no crystal ball. And of course, the same question sort of applies for syncs, but comes up much less often because you're usually trying to sync exactly a T. So that's one dimension of overloading. What form do parameters take? There's another equally important dimension, overloading on method qualifiers. Uh, 
This is a very important variation on overload sets. We can overload based on ref qualifiers or const qualifiers. We see this in const cases. Uh, overloads that vary in const qualification tend to be of the form access the underlying data in a const appropriate fashion. Overloads that vary on ref qualification tend to be about optimization. You can do the one thing safely, the L value version, and we know that if we are operating on an R value version, we can more aggressively optimize our use of the type, leaving the object as a whole in a valid but unspecified state. So for instance, in C++20, assuming everything gets voted through, uh, there's an overload for string buff stir that's going in that is R value ref qualified. And the usage for this would be you stood move the string buff and you call stir. And when we use this pattern, we don't need to worry about scary naming for these destructive member operations. Consistency with higher level rules, don't touch moved from objects, does all of the warning that we need to do. That's a nice feature. And also, forming these performance when available overload sets is a nice way to be future compatible. We can all write this call right now everywhere that we have a string buff, and it doesn't matter if your standard library implements it. Once your standard library does implement it, boom, it optimizes better. That's a nice thing to have. Bryce. What about for a method where it's, um, it's only the R value ref points? That makes sense. I will get there. The question was, I guess I don't need to repeat it, because I will get there. Uh, and of course, when we combine the two, we can keep const correctness and provide good optimization where it's available, like in the case of optional value. We need four more. We need four more for volatile, says Marshall, and Marshall gets voted out of the room. <laughs> uh, it's important to note, these types of overload sets still meet our general definition for good overload set. A user does not need to know which one is being called. And a single comment can describe, probably more clearly, the behavior of the overload set without having comments trying to explain all of the individual ones and their differences without trying to explain move semantics in that comment. Jonathan. Any particularity in the string buff doesn't feature the reference or the string buff? Uh, we, any, the question was, any particular reason the string buff doesn't return a reference while this one does? Uh, I'd have to think about it. Um, I think it's right, but I'd have to think about it. Alan. I have plenty of trouble understanding the last one. I think it's useful for generics and otherwise kind of silly. But, but are equals delete it? Is that a good idea? No, please don't equals delete it, Arthur. Alistair. <laughs> the string buff, historical legacy. You weren't guaranteed you had a string internally as part of the storage representation. Oh, there you go. Without the move semantics, it didn't make it, might not have made much sense. Yeah, and usually if it's not because you're varying on qualifier, uh, the return value from your overload set should be the same. So this one, uh, yeah, well, it, yeah, anyway. Uh, oh, I, while we're here, we should talk a little bit about method qualifiers on their own without the aid of an overload set, just on methods. What do ref qualified methods mean when not part of a set? What do const qualified methods mean? If you've got nothing but a ref qualifier, that means uh, R value ref qualifier, that means do once. This is a good design for destructive operations and things like call at most once. This is a call once function, or the usage of a call once function object. It should be used, however, only when the L value equivalent semantic would break the semantics of the type. Right? Don't do this because optimization, do this because maintain type invariance. On the flip side, L value qualifying function says, don't do this on temporaries. And that comes up very infrequently outside of overload sets. Uh, but does have one use case that we've been talking about. We should maybe be L value qualifying assignment operators. Uh, when we do so, when we have a temporary of the type and try to assign to it, that stops compiling. Bugs along those lines are rare, but it is nice to be consistent with, like, do what int does. Int would break here. I don't know. not conceptually similar enough. The question was, uh, why is this OK versus uh, the L value thing to, to prevent temporaries? Um, this falls much more in line with do what int does. And there is no valid, like I can tell you that there's no reason to do this on a value type. 
on a type that has no side effects, there is definitely no reason to do this. With the assignments, and it would be a reasonable thing to do in terms of lifetime semantics when it would be stupid from a programming point of view. So to Vittorio points out that we could uh, pass this thing as a R value assigned uh, as a parameter to something else, and I don't care. Like, this is honestly not either as much of a bug as that I'm going to lose any sleep over it, but it does give us consistency with int. Moving away from references, what do we really mean when we const qualify a thing? And this is, starts to get more interesting. Uh, hypothetically, if we marked every method as const and every member as mutable, everything builds just fine. But of course, that is an absolutely rotten type to work with. Const should mean const. But there are certainly types that have mutable members, and those aren't necessarily a problem. What is the root of that connection? How do we use const and mutable well in design? Right. The question was, are there any examples in the standard of functions that are only L value or only R value ref qualified? And I don't think so. Yeah, I don't <laughs> think so. Nothing springs to mind. Um, yeah, we got half of LAWG in here and we can't think of one. Uh, There are a couple of cases Matt points out that are equals deleted that are kind of similar, but yeah. Um, anyway, const. What is the root of the connection between const and mutable in design? And I suspect that there are a couple ways to view this, but the one that has given me actual mileage is the tie between const methods, mutable members, and thread safety. The standard has some things to say about this, but it says it in a fairly obtuse fashion. I'm, not even 100% sure that this is actually the right section. If you squint, it talks about read access, write access, modification, and const arguments. And according to the person who shall not be named that claims responsibility for this wording, it is horrible wording. But the intent is roughly this. Const accesses to standard types do not cause data races, and standard types are thread compatible unless otherwise specified. I should define thread compatible. Thread compatible means concurrent invocation of const methods on this type do not cause data races. If any concurrent mutating operation, any concurrent non-const operation on this type is happening, then everything needs to be synchronized. Do what ints do. do. Thread safe is concurrent invocation of, of methods, be they const or non-const, on this type do not cause data races. This is for mutex. Do what, do what atomic int does. Do what atomic int does, says. Uh, there is also, of course, thread unsafe. Should not do that lightly. More on that later. Uh, it is interesting to note that if you build out of thread compatible or thread safe types and you don't use the mutable keyword for your members, you're probably thread compatible. There are some scenarios where pointers are shared around and that isn't true. More on that later. In this model of things, const is less about am I changing some internal values and more about it is safe to call this method concurrently. And with that model of things, we can at a glance see that this class is thread unsafe unless response is inherently thread safe. And when you spot this pattern in code review, the default reaction is you add a mutex. But you know what just happened? We started talking about properties of the types, which means we're finally ready to move on from overload sets and low level API design and talk about higher level stuff. But it is also important to remember this bridge. There is a bridge across these domains from small API design to types. Const is a promise about your values and also a promise about the ways that it is safe for your type to interact with the rest of the program. Let's talk about types. In what ways can the design of a type vary? Well, of course, there's thread safety. Uh, there are three options for thread safety under most categorizations. You can have thread safe types. Uh, that's great. If you have decided that you want a thread safe type, go for it. You are probably paying something for this, either in synchronization costs or API and design constraints. So as long as you understand what you are paying for it, thread safe types, no one's going to complain about your design. 
right? Thread compatible. This should be your default. And in fact, this is what you get when you're not paying attention too much. This is the default for the standard library. Const methods can be invoked concurrently. Non-const methods mean that we need synchronization. This fits very nicely with the philosophy of C++. You don't pay for what you don't use. If your program is single-threaded, you aren't paying for unnecessary synchronization unless the library maintainers out there have mutable keywords in, or mutable members in vector for some crazy reason. I strongly suspect there's no mutable members anywhere in the standard, uh, except for maybe in a thread safe type somewhere. There used to be some in like reverse iterator. There used to be some in reverse iterator, but not anymore. Uh, thread unsafe types, these are usually mistakes. Uh, it is rare to write a thread unsafe type intentionally these days. I've seen three or four in the wild in the last year, and every single one of them was a bug. There are, I will admit, some interesting cases where they could be fine. Uh, you could use thread unsafe types in thread local storage, uh, or you can leave the mutable members unsynchronized in your thread compatible type if you can magically promise that there's only one thread in your program. Uh, that is... Both of those are kind of in theory. In practice, I have never seen anyone optimize for those, and I would be deeply skeptical. Uh, Alistair. I've seen good arguments for a thread unsafe optimization on shared pointer, where your shared pointer objects never leave the same thread. So long as you, the question was, or the point was, <coughs> good reason, or good arguments for a thread unsafe shared pointer, so long as you know that they never leave that thread. And that is the important point. You said, so long as you know that they never leave that thread. Right? This is a type that is going to have more sharp edges. Absolutely. But like, you could definitely justify that so long as you have that external knowledge. It takes more knowledge to use those types. Explain why shared pointer is thread unsafe as opposed to thread Oh, no. Thread, uh, shared pointer is thread compatible yes, you currently. Thread you could build a thread so unsafe one. Makes it unsafe. You don't have to use atomic synchronization on the ref count. I understand. And therefore, you don't have to. I'm just not, I'm not catching your reference. Why shared pointer without an atomic construction is, is I understand the concept that if two threads access it at the same time, in a const scenario, it should work, no? If they copy it, that's fine. If, if they copy it, the reference count still has to change. Ah, okay. Right? Yeah. It's unsafe. Mm -hmm. um, so that's one property that a type could have. Uh, comparability, of course. Uh, are equals equals and not equals defined? Um, one of the things I really love about the work to define concepts for the standard library is that we are more explicitly enforcing semantics instead of just syntax. Yes, you could, in the past, write a type where equals equals is how you express launch the missiles. Uh, but the committee is increasingly not going to pretend that your type is allowed or good or anything at all. Um, so only define those if you actually mean this type is comparable. And when we start discussing comparability, we have to introduce a very important idea in type design. What is the logical state of your type? There's a critical distinction in many cases between the physical state of a type and a logical state of a type. For instance, a C++ string can be represented in several different ways, but is logically just a sequence of characters, regardless of your representation. The way it was constructed doesn't matter. Its reservation, its allocation doesn't matter. In most cases, one of these is going to be an SSO, and the other is going to have an allocation of 1,000 bytes. And that assertion is always going to be true. Right? There's a difference between the physical state, the data representation of that type, and the logical state of that type. Good? Anyway, sort of a side note. Types may have a difference between their physical and logical state, of course. Once you have decided on the logical state, you can answer the question, should this be comparable? And comparability operates on the logical state of the type. By default, I would say most of your types that are about values should, of course, be comparable. And incomparable types are mostly those that are more like objects that are about behavior. Um, I would certainly recommend putting a little thought into it before creating types that are not comparable. Since we talk about comparable, we can talk about ordered. Is there a partial or total order for your type? Please don't define an ordering just to put something in a map. Right? The properties, <laughs> right? If you need sort order for storage, that is a property of the storage, not a property of the type. Okay? You don't define operator less than on chair because you want to put chair in a map. There are many reasonable ways that you could order 
a collection of chairs. You could order them by height or number of legs or comfortability, right? It is not a fundamental aspect of the object, what its order is. Ordering, of course, depends on the logical state of the type, not the physical state of the type. And please only define the order in comparison operators if you're actually defining an operator. Don't use those to launch the missiles. If you're building a totally ordered type, totally fine. No one's going to complain about that so long as it actually represents a logical ordering of those things. Please don't build partially ordered types unless, and if you are going to, please don't name them operator less than. I recognize that this is the, requi the minimum requirement to put these things in several STL algorithms. That does not make it pleasant to work with. This is a consistent form of bugs. David. Can you give us an example of a partially ordered type? Uh, so yeah. partially ordered means float. Float if you get into uh, ugly values, yes. Um, partially ordered means that, <coughs> rather, totally ordered means that for any two t's, exactly one of less than, equal, or greater than will be true. Partially ordered does not mean that. Can you give an example? Float. So when you talk about float, there's a whole lot of side discussion about so long as we have avoided nan and inf, right? And float is totally ordered so long as we have avoided nan and inf. And we're just going to pretend that you can manage your code and avoid nan and inf. And if you can do that, then they are totally ordered and fine. Otherwise, they're partially ordered and you could get into trouble. Chandler. Graph theory has lots of partial orderings. Graph theory has lots of partial orderings, yes. Uh, and if you just don't want to define comparison for your types, that is perfectly reasonable. No one is going to complain at you. Copyable. Given a T, can you duplicate its logical state into a new T? There are two important constraints if you have decided that your type is copyable. If you have an, op an assignment operator, you would better have a copy constructor. <laughs> it does not quite go the other way around, but it almost always does. And it is, of course, the logical state that is copied. If you have both assignment and comparison, then, T, uh, then A equals B implies A equals equals B. Right? If you get that wrong, your type is bad, and you should feel bad. Uh, it's perfectly reasonable to build copyable types, so long as you understand what is being copied. It is reasonable in some cases to build non-copyable types. No judgment. Given a T, can you modify its logical state at all, in some cases, and explicitly and importantly via operator equals? Totally reasonable for your types to be mutable, and there are a handful of cases where immutable is great. We'll get into those later. And then there's movable. When I started cataloging type design properties, movable was important and frustrating. It was, for instance, annoying, like I said before, that std is move constructible doesn't really tell you if it is efficient to move the type, or whether it only whether it can be constructed from a temporary. And that felt like a case where the type system and the traits machinery is describing the syntax, but where the semantics was a mismatch. But then, now that we're leaning into move as an optimization of copy, period, full stop, and conceptualizing these as an overload set, I'm not even sure there's a separate property for movable in general. It's just kind of lumped into, is there a one arg t constructor? It's probably a mover copy. Uh, and so I would say you go back to the copyable slide and you replace copyable with copyable removable and you update accordingly. Uh, and more generally and importantly, what invariance does your type have? From a certain perspective, much of type design is actually just about choosing and enforcing invariance. For example, consider the invariance on vector. Capacity is greater than or equal to size. Data sub i is valid for all i in that range and isn't for the other ones, you need to go both ways. Data is valid and non-null for with an allocation of capacity, assuming it's non-empty. Uh, or there's preconditions on optional. Right? If has value is true on optional, then the member is a constructed and valid T. If not has value, then not. Invariants are why we have data access restrictions. Core Guidelines says this, if we want to enforce a relation among members, we need to make them private and enforce that relation through constructors and member functions. C++ style guide from Google says, make data members private in classes. This is largely a simplification. It would technically be fine, I guess, under design principles. Uh, if there were a couple data members in your class that had nothing to do with the invariance of your class, you could make them public. But then there's the whole don't be weird rule and that would be 
Point xy is his point, and some types don't have invariants, right? That's what we mean, and we'll get into structs later. Uh, so for simplicity, Google just says make it private for classes. And wake up time. Here we get into novel territory, and a word of warning, I'm going to use precondition in a slightly squishy fashion, not in standard ease. I'm not differentiating here between preconditions and requires clauses, wide or narrow contracts, uh, preconditions that if you violate them give you UB versus throw an exception, all of that. This talk is already plenty long. But invariants on a type tend to interact with the preconditions on the interface of that type in ways that we don't normally think of as being part of the type design, although Lisa's work starts to sort of explore that area. But just like we saw with const methods blurring the line between micro design and macro design, API preconditions interact with type invariants in ways that I'm starting to find very interesting and not usually discussed. And in some cases, these preconditions can have, I'm calling them external dependencies, dependent preconditions. So what do I mean by precondition and what do I mean by dependent precondition? There are preconditions on vectors APIs. For operator square brackets, we require that in the index is less than size. There are preconditions on optional value requires has value. For most types, certainly most good types, they are designed in such a way that the preconditions for using any API can be expressed in terms of the public API of the type, can be satisfied by the type itself, with information just available in that API. But not all API preconditions are like that. There isn't necessarily always a way to query your type in order to answer questions about whether its preconditions are upheld. You just have to have knowledge coming from the rest of the program. For instance, what are the preconditions for dereferencing int star? Obviously, the underlying int must still be valid. But there is something different about that precondition than the precondition for operator square brackets. How are int star and vector different? Under many traditional notions of type design, these are not different. They are both regular, and we'll get into that. But one way of describing these differences all the preconditions on vector can be verified by vector. That is not the same for int star. Marshall. But not all the preconditions on vectors constructors. But not all the preconditions on vectors constructors, such as? So the constructor that takes a pointer and a, and a length. The constructor that takes a pointer and a length. Mm -hmm. True, fair. You don't have a vector yet. But you don't have a vector yet. That's why I said the preconditions on the constructor. Yes, except the preconditions on the constructor. John. So this is where it gets interesting. You don't talk about preconditions that are sort of language-wide. So for example, it is a general precondition that you would never pass in something, say, when any anytime anything takes a pointer and the and the, the thing is expecting a pointer to an object and null is not an option, mm -hmm. and yet you pass in null, uh, I mean, it may or may not, it, it, may, it may just simply be and again, we have the notion of references where you're not even allowed to check. So pointers, at least you could conceivably check that it's, it's null. But now imagine you pass in a pointer and it isn't pointing to a valid object. Mm -hmm. Now you have the situation where there's no way to check mm -hmm. and you have to know about it. Also true. So, um, John's point I would summarize as uh, we don't usually list the like general language preconditions. And that is very true and I'm kind of getting there. Alistair. Vector is still subject to software terrorists destroying elements in place. True. Vector is still subject to bad, bad users destroying elements in place and things like that. Yes, true. Uh, and interestingly, there's an overlap between some of these dependent preconditions and the thread safety of the type. We cannot talk about the thread safety of types like int star without including knowledge of what they are depending on. You cannot read through a dereferenced int star without synchronization or structural knowledge that proves that nobody is modifying the underlying int concurrently. Otherwise, you have a data race. Going back to our categories of thread safety, int star isn't even thread unsafe. There are APIs on int star that cannot necessarily be called safely, even if access to the int star is mutex protected for both read and write. That is, because it has preconditions that depend on data outside of the type, the thread safety of the type is a question that is more than just the API of the type plus its data members. 
we have to include everything that it is dependent upon. But that's not really fair, right? Without external knowledge that the vector isn't shared, you also can't do anything to a vector. If I hand you a random reference to a vector, that's not necessarily safe. If I hand you a random const vector reference, if you don't know from external knowledge that no one else is mutating that, it is not a thread safe type, it is a thread compatible type. Right? Const doesn't help you enough. Right? In fact, you can't really even guarantee that nothing happened between checking vector size and invoking operator square bracket without that external knowledge that vector isn't shared and being modified elsewhere. We have to remember, everything is thread compatible, not thread safe, and valid programs don't have data raises. And the most important structural piece of information about a program, the one that we rely on all the time when discussing types, is whether we know an object is maybe shared or aliased. But we're using that, but we're doing that implicitly. For types that are about sharing, pointers, it takes more than just the knowledge of if that pointer is shared to assume that same structure. But without that structure, we cannot have a safe program. And thus, there is fundamentally a different level of knowledge and thread safety uh, involved when we look at a pointer than when we look at a vector. We can't know that we're still in a thread safe world without connecting the type, the pointer, to the underlying data in question. Int star is different than vector. We can't use its full API in safety without knowledge that isn't contained in the type. Question. Yes. About aliasing, do you consider the default to be, if you don't say otherwise, then the object or function is alias safe, or do you feel that it's the other way around? John's question is, by default, if you don't say that a function is alias safe, uh, is it safe or not safe? Right, in other words, what's the default? It's alias safe unless you say it isn't? Uh, the compiler safe. doesn't say that. My, but my question to you, for good, for good API design, is the assumption that it's alias safe or is the assumption that it's not alias safe? I will admit that I do not usually plan for alias questions. Like, I, it does not come up often enough in practice to burn the cycles checking for it, and it doesn't match what the compiler is going to optimize which is an unfortunate state. Like, we need, we need a restrict in the language. So for super low level components, we would say it's not alias <coughs> or it would be. In other words, we would be, because otherwise we're gonna have clients who are gonna assume it is and we're gonna get bugger for us. Right. So for our own preservation, yeah. we default to alias safe unless it's not. And of course, copy and move in C is an example where they yeah. John says they try very hard for low-level components to make sure that they are alias safe. And I think otherwise. that's, or say otherwise, yeah. And I think that makes sense. Um, this dependent precondition concept is a property that we don't usually talk about when we're talking about type design. Um, and the majority of types that we consider good avoid this issue, but not all of them. Int star certainly has some issue here. String view has the same issues. Uh, unique pointer. Uh, has a not data dependency issue, but a usage correctness issue. Uh, there is a implied requirement on correct usage of unique pointer that no other unique pointer has that value. That is the whole unique name. Or, or Alistair. It's no other thing thinks it's going to have ownership, shared pointers, etc. Right, no other thing thinks it's going to have ownership, shared pointers, etc. Um, this idea of dependent preconditions, I don't love this name, but I think the idea has impact, and we'll get into that a little bit more. Uh, I think it is safe to say that we definitely favor types that have no such conditions. Introduce contained types without worry. Introduce types that have dependent preconditions only after some significant thought and design work. I'm not sure that they are inherently bad, but they are definitely harder. And now we have sort of a taxonomy of properties that we can discuss when we're talking about types that are well designed or rather that follow designs that are easy to work with. For, of course, uh, <clears throat> for instance, of course, there are regular types. Regular is usually defined by looking at the set of properties that are required in order to use types safely in standard algorithms or ranges. Uh, in P0898, we have an uh, actual formal proposal to describe the uh, regular concept for the standard library. It is a little less requirements than Stepanov's descriptions specifically because it does not require ordering. Uh, I'm going to use the 898 definition in this just because it is actually in standards proposals. Um, I'm also mostly going to ignore swappable uh, 
I feel like that is primarily a syntactic thing. If you are copyable or movable, be swappable. What's up with you? Um, I haven't come up with reasons to do, uh, to do otherwise. But based on these syntactic properties, we'll usually get examples to show that regular types behave regularly. Snippet. And if we look at snippets like this where we fill in the T with specific types, we see, oh, int is regular. Does not matter what some T returned, does not matter what do stuff does, that assertion is going to be fine. Ah. And int star is regular. Does not matter if do stuff is accessing it. Sort of. For instance, if we dereference the pointer, which is what pointers are there for, then this snippet may have a data race and is undefined behavior. If there are threads in the program that we don't know whether the underlying int is being mutated, this requires external knowledge about the program, more than just this type, to state that the snippet is correct. And worse, it is implementation defined to equality, com uh, whether it is legal to equality compare a pointer after deleting it. If do stuff is deleting the pointer, this snippet may no longer be good. Uh, Richard and I had an interesting talk about this one's messy uh, just earlier today. But at the same time, int star is copyable, movable, default, constructible, swappable, assignable, comparable. It's regular, but our snippet is borked. That's an unhappy result. There is something about the types that have dependent preconditions and about their interaction with the structure of the program and about preconditions as a whole, uh, especially those preconditions that interact with the API requirements of regular. And interestingly, of course, this also ties back to thread safety and const. If we use our rotten type, where all of the methods are const qualified and the members are all mutable, then these calls to do stuff can actually be mutating it. And further, could be kicking off threads that also mutate it, making this also not only an assertion failure, but a data race. So I'd argue that implicitly, even regular types require some sort of knowledge external to the type. Const means const, or thread compatibility, or something. And in the case of types that have external dependencies, like int star, then thread compatibility is ill-defined. And the same is true of string view or span. If we are operating on string view in a program without data races, then we know that operator equals equals does not race, and the underlying buffer still exists and isn't being mutated. And as long as we have that external knowledge, string view and span are regular. They are, they are copyable, movable, swappable, default, constructible, assignable, and comparable. So long as you know that the underlying thing is not racing and that you can call operator equals equals on it, You did not take distinct copy into regular, I don't think. Uh, the APIs on these types that have no dependent preconditions are thread compatible. The APIs on these types that have dependent preconditions are thread compatible if and only if we take them as a whole with the underlying buffer. But that result is trash because real regular, actual regular, regular that we like defines types that you can put in a container like a well, usually it used to be map, but now it's unsorted set because we're not requiring ordering. Uh, you can put these types in an unsorted set and they won't explode. You can put string view in such a set, but only if you really, really know what you're doing. The underlying buffer will outlive the set and the underlying buffer won't change to become the value of some other string view that's in the set and break your set. I have a question about the unordered containers. Um, stepping off requires that equality comparison be due to a linear time in the work case. And I'm wondering, does the standard require that, or does the standard relax it to be a sort of kind of linear time? Uh, the question is about the comparison between uh, Stepanov's requirements on... Uh, a regular type can be uh, equality compared in linear time in right. the worst case, and I think that's a very strong requirement. Mm -hmm. And almost linear time seems just fine for real people. And I'm wondering, does the standard consider the unordered containers to be regular? I do not believe that I've done the check on that. So where does this leave us? Let's re-examine the requirements for regular. These are the stated requirements. These describe the requirements for a type that you could put in such a really crappy set, one that doesn't store its members in an ordered fashion, but whose members are unique via comparable. There's an implied requirement. All of the explicit requirements are applying some semantic requirement to the syntax that we expect for values. And the implied requirement feels different. 
This is about how a type interacts with the rest of the program. We need it to be race free. Whoa, I skipped a slide, and that's an important. And now we can tie this back to our weird prelude about non-Euclidean geometry. One of these things is not like the others. And to me, there's an obvious parallel. We have some options when we define the, uh, how we know that we have race-free use of the type. We can say, is it race-free only for T? Or we can say, is it race-free for T and its dependence? Or we can say, is it race-free because I know that this is single-threaded? The best types are thread-compatible and have no dependent preconditions, and all that we need to know is that T itself is being used race-free. If you think back to the snippet, we saw T constructed as const and passed as const. If it is thread-compatible and self-contained, we know that it will work fine. Some types, types, that is, S-O-M-E types, uh, types with dependent preconditions may require that we know that T and its dependents are used in a race-free fashion. And if we know that, we can still reason about the type. But it is, of course, harder to know that. Or we can sometimes know that the program or the usage of this type is only single thread, and, or that the type only lives in thread locals or things like that. We would still really like const to mean const, and we don't currently have a other reason to require that, but separately. But that would be enough to say this is race free. And I particularly like this approach for enumerating the variations on the implied requirement. I am not saying that regular types as we understand them are wrong. Euclidean geometry is the correct default. <laughs> but there are other geometries that are worth discussing, and importantly, when we recognize that we are making a choice, when we recognize that our parallel to the parallel postulate has some options, we can start investigating the resulting design space. Value types, types with no dependent preconditions, types that we like, should be regular, period, full stop. We'll call it Stepanov regular. Those are going to be the easiest and best and work well. They require no external knowledge. If your type is going to have dependent preconditions of any form, they are best when they don't intersect the requirements of regular. Its dependent precondition doesn't touch assignment or comparison. Think carefully before going down that route. Because its comparison operator has dependent preconditions, string view is certainly not Stepanov regular, but it is still useful. We just need mechanisms to describe the difference between this useful but sharp-edged type and types that are actually irregular and truly garbage. It's not Stepanov regular, Maybe it's non-Euclidean regular. Let's look at other families of types that are thought to be okay and see how this works. It's been suggested, thank you Matt, that anything that is a subset of regular is probably okay. For instance, semi-regular. These are objects that can be treated as values minus comparability. This is roughly the set of types that you could put in a vector. This is commonly raised as the more traditional correct design for a type like span. If it can't compare in a regular fashion, in a Stepanov regular fashion, don't make it comparable. But that brings us back to descriptivist or prescriptivist design. If you're a pragmatist, a descriptivist, you're probably more interested in this non-Euclidean view. If you're a theorist or a prescriptivist, you're probably pro make span semi-regular. Both sides have excellent arguments. If we overdo it on the pragmatist side and start allowing more and more exotic, irregular designs with no common groundwork, no theoretical basis, the usability of our libraries will go up in flames. If we overdo it on the theorist side, we prevent many designs that are practically useful but not stepping off regular. This may even get us into violation of this philosophy of C++. There's no room for a more efficient language between us and the hardware, even when it comes with foot guns. We have to find ways to incorporate the best non-Stepanov regular designs into our body of knowledge about type design. Enough about regular. Let's look at other families of type designs that are known to be okay. Immutable for sharing. Uh, once in a while you want to put together a type that is immutable from construction. These are really handy because they're thread safe without synchronization. Of course, like I said, you always pay for thread safety with something. In this case, you pay for it with the fact that you can't move from them or swap them or assign them. If you're passing them around through lots of things, you're paying for a lot of copies. There's the most C++11 of all new designs, the move-only type. This is also a subset of regular. 
Uh, these almost always represent some finite resource, memory, hardware, network resource. They're almost certainly going to be interesting data invariants there or API preconditions there. Considering the amount that we discuss move-only types, it's basically unique pointer and little else. If you aren't asserting unique ownership of some form of resource, new types should very rarely model this design, and you should probably have an API review discussion before going down this path. I won't say they're good, but they're common. You have business logic types. These are your behavior, not state, objects more than values. These can be usually justified to be thread safe or thread compatible. They're sort of a subset of regular sometimes. Uh, they shouldn't be comparable or assignable. They're really grouping all of the behavior of your program and hopefully operating on values, values that are following one of the other good designs. How about structs, Tony? A struct is a type that has no invariants that must be upheld and none of its data members will ever be part of an invariant unless you do some crazy refactoring work. These tend to inherit just the default behaviors for comparison, copy, etc., from the language based on their component members. Since there are no invariants, just make everything public. But the essence of struct in design is has no invariants. Standard provides us a clear example of this in pair. And of course, a struct of regular types is regular, and a struct of non-Euclidean regular types is non-Euclidean regular, and man, I just cannot get away from that. And then there's the big question, are reference types okay? What is the design for such a thing? How do we design such a thing? Yes? So before you go to reference types, um, is there a, a subset of regular that is assignable, and I'm thinking chrono durations here, it's assignable, copyable, um, but it's immutable. Otherwise. It's assignable, but otherwise immutable? Mm -hmm. Assignable is mutable. Yeah, but it's, it, there is a difference there. Yeah. It, that's like, it becomes an optimization to a, you have another one. Of course, that's Yeah. Good. I think that's somewhat more like, yeah, I like the idea. I like the comparison. Um, and I think there's, I think there is a lot to be said for this is an opaque representation of something, don't mess with it. Um, and that might be worth putting in this taxonomy explicitly. Yeah, I kind of like that idea. Structure? Yeah, was that something? Without internal structure. Right, and the, the question, I'm sorry for not repeating, the question was uh, what about things like duration that are not, they have no other mutability other than you can assign to them and they're largely just kind of an opaque thing. Um, yeah, I, I, I kind of dig that. Anything else? Running low on time. Uh, right, John. I'll wait till later. I just want to point out quickly now that value semantics and regular types are sort of the jewels of each other, where regular types are syntactically based and value semantics is semantic based. Mm -hmm. And it is a fact that if you have a value semantic type and you remove operations from it, it remains a value semantic type, even though it ceases to be regular. I like that comparison. John says uh, value semantics and regular syntax. Uh, value types, regular types are duals, and uh, for a value type, uh, removing uh, removing APIs from it still makes it a value, although it stops being regular. And that sort of matches what we're seeing of there are good things that are just a subset of regular. Yes. Yeah. So then there's the big question, reference types. What is the design for such a thing? How do we define such a thing? Are we okay with such a thing? Uh, clearly, for a non-reference Stepanov regular value type, a type with no external dependencies, we know the old rules about const assignment equality. And they hold, of course, they are correct. But the outstanding question that we're wrestling with, that I'm wrestling with, for a type that has dependent preconditions, do the rules about const assignment equality hold on the type alone, or on the type plus its dependencies, plus its data dependencies? Can we recognize that these are in a different design space than Stepanov regular? We can't reason about these types or use them safely in any program without external information about invariance, mutation, synchronization, and or thread safety in the first place. Is that enough for us to include that knowledge when we describe their design and their properties? Or put it bluntly, is string view operator equals equals okay? is string view and span how we write reference types. If we aren't doing it this way, I think we have to push towards concepts or ranges or something everywhere a lot harder. And I'm okay with that outcome 
but I suspect that based on std function and callable, we probably aren't actually doing that. So we have to start agreeing, and soon, on exactly what makes for a good reference type, because that problem is only going to accelerate. And so these are the questions that I'm left with and that I leave with you. What is the future for reference parameters? Are we doing concepts, reference types, ranges, something else? Is the design of string view and span right? Maybe string view by alone, because span does have some slightly additional funky bits, but I don't think that the difference in const is actually the interesting part there. Uh, and how does this notion of types with dependent preconditions affect how we think about design theory? Alistair. Just a quick one, Sam, what you mean by reference types. So yes, no question. Uh, uh, shared pointer and iterators reference types or not in your model here? Our shared pointer and iterator reference types. Iterator definitely is. And shared pointer, I would have to think about more. Thanks. Tony. Tony. Um, this is awesome. Uh, Thank you. I just like an hour ago, you know, was tweeting an argument with someone about this, and and the part that that and it's exactly the same thing of the of the uh, dependent precondition. I said when you have a type with that's regular and it has a, the nice copy constructor and everything, and it's more than those regular properties, it's a distinct copy. Yeah. Is that when you you've got these objects, or maybe you have reference to them, or, or whatever? If you have reference to them, references passed in, you don't know what else is going on. Uh, you know, someone else has a reference to them. But as soon as you make copies, and now you have everything is local. If I right. just have copies of these items. Mm -hmm. I can do local reasoning. I don't have to think about there are no dependent preconditions. Right. So I'm right on the same page as you, mm -hmm. and and that. That is what regular is supposed to mean. Whether the syntax of regular says that, regular is supposed to mean. The whole point, one of the key things about regular is, if your types are regular, then you can do local reasoning. You can look at this function, see what this function does, and not have to think about any other part of your program. It's, I can just look at this. And so that's what we're weighing against, right? Mm -hmm. and, and you're hitting the exact same thing. It's like, these types might be useful, but realize when you use them, you can't do local reasoning anymore. You have to consider that, how, and, and then how you use them will decide how far out, you know, having them only as parameters, well, it's like, well, the reasoning is here and the person who called me, yep. right? And maybe that's okay. And then you put it in a struct somewhere, and now it's like full program reasoning, you know, suddenly, so. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Tony agrees, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the point about dependent preconditions and regular types and the idea that regular types means that even if you got a vector reference, you can just make a copy of it and then you stop having to worry about reasoning about anything but local reasoning, which is correct. Those are the types that we want most of. Um, Arthur. Honestly, I added that bullet when I saw the talk earlier today that was about uh, building a filter view. Oh, sorry. Please repeat the question. I'm terrible at this. Um, should pass around a mic for the audience. Uh, the question was, what do I mean by ranges when I have that in this bullet list? Uh, I literally added this to the slides after seeing the talk earlier today on a view about views uh, and seeing like, oh, I just want the keys of this map and writing a view that extracts just the keys of the map for any random map. And you could do that, like that fits in the same thing. Yeah, like at some point, I suspect that the answer winds up being you wind up with specifically designed reference types or heavier weight type erased types. Because I think in practice, that's really the only thing that we're going to do because we pass these things through additional interfaces and we store them and all of those things. Chandler. Still, 
generic concepts or non-generic reference types, there'd be some level of type erasure. Even if it's not what we traditionally think of as type erasure, right? Uh, screen view is doing some kind of virtual dispatch in order to do type erasure. It still is fundamentally type erasure. It's taking something that's completely generic, right, and it's providing a concrete way of accessing that data. Right. And so, so I think we are still stuck between these two these two approaches, and we have to figure out which one is the, the right one, or, or how to do both and leave the thing in the same place. Chandler argues that ranges should probably be struck here because ranges is implemented in terms of one or the other. I think that's probably fair. Victoria. Do I think that we would not need reference types if we were allowed type erasure in terms of concepts? Louis looks like he really wants to answer that. Yeah, I think it's still the case, right? So, so you have owning type erasure, you have non-owning type erasure, and then you have concepts where there's just no type erasure. So these are three yeah, yeah, different things. What I'm saying is, imagine you had a speaker in the language that said, like, here's what concept is. Yeah. You would say, this function takes a callable by virtual concept, so it's a type erase wrapper, but you don't have to put it through well, that would be a new another use case. Right, so you could say something like any, Bravo, for example, or, or any something, you know, ref, right? Isn't that would that be a, or any callable, right? right? Yeah. So, so that would be equivalent to your to the function yeah. Yeah. But so isn't that a reference type? Yeah. That wouldn't be a reference type. So right? we so wouldn't so need reference types if we had a way of doing this with concepts. Yeah. You, would that would, but you would also not need to function anymore because you would just tell it any callable. Yeah, but the, it, so, it, so you would not uh, need to do it. You would need software. references to concepts yeah, yeah. 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 and the ability to store it. Yeah, but it would still be a reference of some form. Gone all the way around that circle. But. Yes, uh, Michael. Um, I was kind of, kind of thought of the last question on sending proof conditions. Um, so taking optimal as an example, looking mm -hmm. at add value versus value, and mm -hmm. um, and also kind of thinking about what Ben talked about earlier in terms of reasoning through statements versus expressions <coughs> and the composability of it. Um, the fact that you have to call add value first before we call value, and that's kind of very distant. Um, makes it difficult to reason about it. But if we were to take a managed API, for example, and say optional dot and then, and that would perform the head value and value uh, together, right? And only only invoke the continuation if there, if there, if there's actually value in it. Um, we have a value or, that's not but that's not the same. I know. Uh, Michael is arguing for monads on everything. No, that's <laughs> Maybe we should be looking for opportunities to um, bundle dependent, like, pre, you know, things that But optional does not have dependent preconditions. It just has preconditions. Mm -hmm. I thought you said it has value and value. That is a precondition, but it can be answered by the type. Right? It is different than the <coughs> precondition on dereferencing a pointer, where there's nothing you can ask the pointer about. Is this going to blow up in my face? Oh, maybe I, maybe I, maybe I missed it. Yeah. Chandler. Chandler's argument is that uh, once we start leaning into concepts more heavily, we will realize that we should be designing regular concepts and we'll be right back in the same place. Yeah. Chandler says Rust is better. <laughs> <coughs>
what Chandler said. Talk less and I'll summarize better. <laughs> parsing what Chandler said, parsing what uh, Michael was saying, um, and back to, to Int Star, your first example. We've had this problem from day one. This problem's yeah. always been there. Mm -hmm. right? And what we've done over the years is say, don't use raw pointers, that's, that's mostly bad. Here's some tools. We'll give you a unique pointer. It still has some preconditions, but we've tried to wrap it up a lot so that as long as you use it properly, you know, you're you're safer. And, mm -hmm. and we keep trying to bring these together. And so, like Michael saying, it's like maybe we can have a type that's like it's a span or whatever it is, but we've we've somehow pulled the dependency in to like it's a span with some you know you can talk to the guy who really owns. I don't know, right? Like it's, but the, but that idea of either we're, we're what we're currently saying is we went through a bunch of years saying. <coughs> Don't use raw pointers. Here's some better things to avoid these problems of dependent, of dependent precondition. And now we're saying, here's a bunch of things that have dependent preconditions. <coughs> go, go crazy. Right? I don't know that I can summarize that. Okay. Okay. I'm Sorry. that. Marshall. I'm going, to, I'm going to quibble just very, very, in a very small way with what Tony said. He said, we, we, we struggle with, it, you know, with, with raw pointers. We have unique pointer, which mitigates these problems, which, uh, which which gets rid of these problems, I disagree. The int pointer has all of the same problems that an int pointer does. It's just harder to misuse. Yeah. yeah. Uh, okay. Unique I'm pointer also... Unique pointer makes it a little easier to reason about mm -hmm. the likely right. it, like scope of like what you need to reason about. I'll ignore the idiot. Like, right. you know, I, can, I can police the idiocity. Here's a gun, pointer to your fun. Oh, it's a genetic pointer gun. It has a safety patch. <laughs> Other questions? Wonderful. Thank you all very much. All right.